right. Hello, everybody. Everybody hear me okay? I know I'm a little soft spoken tonight. <clears throat> kind of a long day, but hope everything's cool. All right. All right, so I think it was last week when we were just sort of spitballing and um, one idea, hey Alex, spitballing kind of like a an idea and doing the, the whole faction idea. So where you take sort of like one general overarching theme and develop like maybe a, a small, medium and large character kind of like all like in the same family. And that can be um, like enemies, that can be indigenous groups. Hey Casper, that can be, hey Josh. Um, what else can that be? Well, pretty much any, any use you can think of where you need kind of like um, some semblance of like a race or like a single existence. Um, you can go anything from like a kind of sea life to like robots things like that so just because I'm I think I'm in the mood to draw a little bit of tech tonight we'll see might change gears if things aren't working out um, I'm gonna do kind of I think I'm gonna do like a like a small sort of I think what um, I'm used to calling a swarmer and then like a medium and then something pretty large in fact I think I use that space to kind of like really go a little top heavy with it or something and then just to kind of make it look a little nice I'll throw it on throw it on like on a slight perspective Nothing too crazy. Should kind of keep us out of too much trouble, though. The problem I have with putting too much perspective on on multiple characters is as you start to move them around for different compositions, sometimes that can make it so that the characters don't quite look right when you move them out of their perspective point on the canvas. But hey, Chris, any sleeping dumplings? Thanks for coming out, everybody. So yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna start just kind of like with some blocking in some general shapes, um, but the key here, and I do tend to start with like a like the swarmer, the small one to kind of get it going, but that's not always the case. Sometimes I'll start with the medium. Sometimes it doesn't really. There's not really a science to this. The only science is that you know like whatever shape logic you end up with. Um, move to a new layer so I can keep my grid whatever shape logic you end up with I'm going to sort of like mimic that in the other ones so that there's like for instance like robots there would be like a similar sort of like building technique you know kind of like uh, just the general construction as if like they all came out of the same factory so I'm going to do do a little robot so the I think the the little one I'm gonna keep relatively simple I want to do something like a little mono tread thing um, and then we'll see what shapes I kind of can draw from pun intended that will kind of lead us to what the designs for some of the larger ones will be So I'm gonna just I'm gonna keep them uh, I think kind of construction like alien construction zone I think uh, maybe some cargo up on the sides here and some sort of 
yeah I think I think I want to keep them just kind of passive little a little bit um, fun not too aggressive tonight we'll do we can uh, definitely like do this a lot where like you know I can revisit three from the same family but I think tonight I just want to keep kind of like a passive uh, fun little character and then we'll figure out what his big brother and his what his bigger bigger brother looks like so hello alright so I'm gonna do like a kind of like a mono lens thing here, and I this is um, one thing I, I like to do when I'm thinking about factions is in video games, or like you know, like the games that I've worked on, um, to give the player like a little tell what the scale is. So if there's like one prominent eye like this, then maybe like the the medium's gonna have two, and then maybe the big one's gonna have like three or something like that. But also kind of keeping them relatively the same size so that they feel like they've been kind of constructed out of the same. This is not, again, I, I don't wanna like say like any of this is science. It's just something I like to do when I'm doing factions. And I do like to do factions. So. Definitely want to do like a tread. I know we did a tread last week, but whatever. Can't make me not do it. I think like one cargo thing in the back here. So no, new antenna. So I'm just kind of like finding my way through, just trying to figure out like what, what this guy could kind of look like. So like I'm, I'm not really digging the vents because they kind of mimic the wheel a little too much. And I'm also, right now I'm realizing like design wise, I've, I've really got like a nice even split where like the body and the tire tread are about the same size, which I don't dig. So I'm gonna reduce that tire size. Try and get more of like a one third, two third ratio. And then I really wanna, because he's doing like the single tread, I think I wanna like reverse this and, and see if I can't get like more of like a top heavy quality to him. <laughs> Maybe his car goes a little bit bigger. Should the environment design also mimic the same shape language as the characters? Is that something you discuss? Yeah, we do. Like, um, if if the characters are, let's um, let's use like the Smurfs for example. Um, if they are the ones that are constructing, and this is, again, I wanna be really clear, this is just theory. Like this isn't, like there's no rules. Like as soon as you say something, you're like, I bet I could break that rule. And that's totally legit. Um, but I think as a, as a general practice, if the character looks like it's in harmony with the environment, they tend to, they tend to be, um, tied into that environment more meaning like if it was like the smurfs and the mushrooms and all that then you then you really feel like they're like one with nature or if it's like um if it's a you know some sort of um if it's a, a race that's like really mining the heck and destroying the environment then you would you know you could equally in integrate them by their machinery and how it's implanted into everything um and then um, oppose those shapes. So you would have like, you know, like 
look look for opportunities to have like really hard shapes to go against nature sharp shapes or whatever you want something really aggressive so that it um, it really doesn't feel like they're supposed to be there so but if you don't want if you want the characters to feel like they're visitors then it's a, then it's a good opportunity for you to make sure that everything really doesn't look like it's it's part of the same family at all it's starting to starting to be something I don't want it to be too simple of a shape but at the same time I don't want to so maybe I don't really know what the cargo is going to be yet, so that's kind of... But we will figure it out. Yeah, so I don't, this tread is kind of bugging me, I'm not sure. I think I want to go with maybe, like you see like on diggers, where it's maybe a bit more of like a pill shape from the side. You got multiple, yeah, that's better. It feels better. And then we can probably do like a little swivel or something so that it feels like it can rotate on its base. Yeah, I'm digging that. That's much better. And then we give him like a little claw or something like that so maybe maybe he does have like a little claw we'll find some way to make like a little construction -y claw up here something like that some pistons and things like that that way he still feels like he's capable but he's just a little bit more of a drone And maybe that's like maybe it's less that he has cargo and it's more that he has like some big mechanism that's kind of like helping him move everything okay so leave him there for now because whatever we discover in some of the other characters may come back to influence him a little bit um, but I'm gonna shrink him down ever so slightly So then for the next guy, do I, I'm going to keep these on separate layers for now, just so I can move them around and cut and paste and things like that. So I'm not going to do treads on all of them. I think this guy, I definitely want to do legs. So I'll do like a little, still want them to be kind of thick. And I definitely want to incorporate dual eyes, binocular vision, so that we can kind of like play up that language that he's slightly more advanced than his little brother there. But we can still mimic that shape, almost like, it doesn't have to be an exact um, understanding of it, but like, or I'm sorry, like, like I, I, I don't really want to like play into too much of the, you know, exactly how things work type thing. That's not, not really that fun right now. Right now I just care about like if the shapes are fun. But now we have like this, this kind of like giant rotation piston. We can use that to create his kinds of shoulders. And that his, his arms be the same thing, but now, you know, he's got the same kinds of claws coming down like that and I think I'm gonna make him <laughs> I moved down onto the wrong layer yep I did cool so let's put 
him on his own layer. Right, we'll just make him a little bit taller. And I am moving a lot quicker than you know. Like I, um, when you're when you're when you're doing this for reals, it's important to go through a lot more iterations of like finding different shapes. But just because, you know, let's have some fun tonight. Not get bogged down with specificity of that stuff. Get something actually down on paper. It's not like we're gonna do like review processes and things like that. So yeah, we'll do like a little, little techie. Move his hips up a little. And these are pretty static poses, and that's where I'm getting. That's that's where I'm. Um, I'm definitely leaning into. These are much more about the design than they are about like the personality of them. But having a little bit of personality is pretty pretty key to kind of selling these things. So we'll find ways to kind of add some of that stuff in in a little bit. And then maybe maybe this guy needs like a like a little smokestack or something. Do like a little diesel action. Tuck those eyes up even more. All right. So that'll be like his quote unquote older brother type thing. I definitely think we're going to be adding some stuff to these guys, but I'm just trying to find like some common ground with them with like the tucked in eyes. And now we have this cylinder working for like how their, their joints work. You know, the modelers and the animators would get kind of mad at me if I only had these big cylinders. So I'm going to have to incorporate some sort of like rotation in them as well. So that he's not just opening his arms just in one direction. <clears throat> All right, let's see if we can remember to stay on another layer this time. So for the big guy, let's borrow your eyes out of that previous layer. And again, playing up like that little hood thing. Let's see where this goes. I think if we can get him feeling really kind of big and top heavy, it'd be kind of cool. And then maybe he's got some machinery that I can imagine is like at the same scale. And again, like when we start filling in some of the gaps and the details in this, I really think it's important to make sure that little construction elements, size of rivets and screws or bolts, whatever, sizes of hinges, things like that, they all remain consistent so they feel like they're all being built in the same facilities. And I'm just gonna be kinda, kinda goofy tonight and get him some big long ass legs and we'll do, I think like, um, some like construction style like pistons and stuff like that so it won't stay boring for too long and then he's gonna have little claw hands as well for now and then if I was pitching a character like this and putting the claw hands on all of them like I think the first conversation would be about like a, like what else can you do with them and I think the as far as like concepting them goes I would still start with sort of like the common stuff first so what is 
universal about them so if I'm going to keep the claws in the initial concepts and then I think I would break them out and start playing with like do they have diggers or all kinds of other things that could kind of make them a bit more unique and modular perhaps you know that's always kind of cool like adds a lot of variation um, and then I think this guy is going to have some smokestacks as well but maybe we'll put them coming out the side of them a little bit I'm starting to run out of room so I'm going to shrink everything and I'll just give everybody a little bit of breath So for me, that's like a, a pretty good starting point. And then if, and I'm, what I'm gonna do is I'm not gonna actually jump right into line work. I'm actually gonna go and do a second line work pass. So I'm just gonna go ahead and I could merge these, but just because of my paranoia, I'm just gonna say, I'm gonna call these roughs. And I'm just gonna put them in a folder and kind of lower them down a little bit. I really shouldn't have drawn those into the grid. That's always a bad habit, too. So let's take those out. My really beautiful grid. Cool. All right, so let's, let's start back on the little guy. I'm not going to worry too much about getting all the things looking beautiful. So I'll, I'll do some, some details, but I really just want to kind of like do like secondary forms, I think, at this point. So, you know, like just so I don't have to work so hard when I'm doing the, the other parts. And I may, again, come up with things that I want to add to the other other cronies over here. So like I, I was thinking like it, I like the like 1950s construction stuff where they always had like rounds on things. So you know there's like this rounded form edging. So nothing's like super rigid feeling. And then I, I really like doing like exposed tech in the back. So we'll probably have like some engineering stuff back here. And let's see how this looks for it. I definitely want to like make it look like the, the wheels are getting turned. Like obviously with one tread, it needs to have almost like a little fender. I think maybe on the center one that'll look cool. And then these these can have, have I don't know I've seen on construction stuff where they have like a little brace that goes all the way through. I think that'll look cool too. All right, so now we got. That's going to work. And just because I'm yapping away, don't don't feel like you can't interrupt me and ask me what the heck I'm doing, if I'm doing anything weird. Kind of play off of like 1950s tractors and stuff a little bit, just so it's not super 
super rigid. So I'm not, I'm thinking more about like this hinge thing here. I definitely play into it a little bit, but I want to see if I can make it look a little bit less simple. I don't know what that means yet. Definitely nice to have like a simple shape to draw. <laughs> so I don't know why I'm complicating it, but I don't. The width of this mechanically is telling me that it needs to be there needs to be something else going on. So it could be as simple as just putting some vents, which would look kind of cool, just so I know that there's like machinery inside there and there's a reason why those things have some width to them. And then that already just satisfies my like, why is something happening? It doesn't have to be believable, it just has to feel believable. Oh, we can actually sneak one of these little smokestacks in back here now. So that can be something that they all have is like that little smokestack. So his will stick out the back. recovery on because I always forget to save some sort of grill in here just so it feels a little bit like this would be like where he's talking from I think saying whatever he's saying and then the claw I'm not gonna go nuts on this claw even though this is one of my favorite things to draw but I have to draw five of them, so I'm not going to go nuts. All right, so we're going to call that our swarmer. Let's see if we can't play this guy up a little bit. So I like, I like this little swell that I ended up with at this guy so I want to make sure that they all kinda can have some of that Let's see what his face is gonna look like in there So he'll probably have the same, generally same kind of grill, but let's give him like a little, little hood action. And we can play up like the, almost like the shovel shape on construction vehicles on this thing, even though it's not really going to move much. Again, playing up that, that cylinder, but so now we have to do have to incorporate. So I think we're gonna leave a little bit of a gap, and we'll just pretend like there's a little bit of a flex joint in there. And that should get us out of trouble with the animators. And then we need an exhaust pipe. Should we kind of keep these all like in the same scale to some degree? And then 
use the technology shapes shape logic that we came up with for the arm so that we have the consistency and I'm not going to be too strict because I just want it to be fun but I don't know, it's starting to feel something, feel like something. So I'm gonna cheat these in a little bit so he doesn't feel like he's just holding them parallel, which should add just a little bit of relaxed vibe to him. Pretty simple legs. I'm gonna do. Um, I'm gonna play up the. Uh, what are those called? The uh, the outriggers that they put on construction vehicles. So we'll have like a like a sort of a three platforms that look like they're kind of like stabilizing him as he walks. You can see I'm starting to get sloppy because I, um, I'm already starting to like think about like how this stuff works, and I because I already kind of generally understand it from the previous one. I'm not being as careful. Which will probably come back to bite me later. Cool. And then for Mr. Older Brother here. the straight sides. And then play up that kind of cantilevered tech thing where the engine is sort of sitting out the side. And we'll do, how, which way do I want to, I think his exhaust pipes just need to stick straight out the side of them. So see how this goes. It could be completely diabolicking. And his grill and yeah these guys are definitely missing the hoses I like to draw so we're just, we'll work some of that stuff in so maybe a couple of Hoses like that coming out of him. Hoses coming out like that. Come out of him. And maybe this guy just has one hose. Plugs in. Kind of cool. And then. Just, we'll keep it all machinery in here, like pretty, pretty exposed machinery with those big kind of shoulder things that we got developed. And actually, it'll give us an opportunity to explain how the tech works in there. Maybe he has like a, they call it a pumpkin on the, uh, on cars, which is the differential. So that'll be, we'll use like an axle vibe for his hips. Lots of extra pistons, because pistons are fun. And then 
What are we gonna do that? His legs. Could definitely do the outrigger thing again. Just make it. What can we do? I'm gonna come back to that because I want to think about like something that could be kind of unique on his feet that still feels construction like. I just start drawing on his feet automatically, just because I felt like it. All right, let's see. So there's his claws. Carry all that tech over, and then for his feet. I'm gonna do, I know, do reversed tripods. So, do so I look too much like a chicken. I'll try it for now. I might change it, but might work. We'll see. We'll see. All right, that seems like a fun character set. Fun enough. Do so. I'm just gonna go ahead and merge those together. Do those. Do those. Or turn the opacity down. And we can just go ahead and start making art. Everybody good? Yeah. I'm gonna use just because it all. It'll be. F I'm gonna use a ruler. Use a two point. That way, if I just have to figure something out, I don't have to f stress about it too much. Do too bad on that laying it out. It's surprising. Usually my grids are a little bit haphazard. Anyway, try not to use it too much. I know it. It's cheating. So let's establish some this eye. I'm going to keep these kind of how I normally draw tech eyes, which is just really just like motorcycle eyes. some of this stuff tonight, but hopefully you guys are a little bit into it.
to establish using the it's nice to put down a few lines just to kind of get sort of the ball rolling here you can see how far my perspective off was it was off already but that's okay kind of looks like a little steam engine So I'm just going to start working up details and I'm not, for me, this is like, this is when I start to kind of relax a little bit and so I think as long as you work your roughs up to, to a point where you feel like you understand where you're going with everything, this, this whole like adding tech part can feel pretty fun. It doesn't have to be too terribly accurate. Oop. I just do. It's pretty interesting that they allow you to copy and paste rulers in here. It's nice. Then you hit control four and you can cycle between your different rulers. That way you're only working on the one that's active at the, any given time. What are you guys working on tonight? Anything? I love, I love using Clip. Clip is great. Um, there's a lot of ways around it. If you if you don't have it now. Um, you can, if you have an iPad, the, the iPad version of Clip is amazing. It's basically the full version. There's very, very, if at all, any differences, so you can start getting used to it. And then, um, if you are already using something else and you just like the idea of the rulers, which a lot of people just they say they want to use Clip just for the rulers. There's a lot of software that um, has them now. Sketchbook Pro has them. And then if you if you want, there's also um, rulers that you can just use. I don't know the name of it, um, but there's just ruler systems that you can use that'll lay on top of whatever program you're working on, working in, and allow you to do a lot of this stuff. The clips are pretty good. I like the sketchbooks as well. Sketchbook has some nice ruler tools.
but if you yeah, if you don't have a Cintiq. Um, using an iPad works really well. Video effects. I love using After Effects. Wish I could do it more. What else we got going on? Working on some perspective exercising and organizing the calendar. <laughs> That's ominous. And you're working on a creature based off of a brittle starfish shape. This is amazing to watch. That's a lot of tech. Yeah, uh, who knows if I'll finish. If I don't finish tonight, either I'll finish it later or I'll just crack it open next week and we can just keep working on it. I imagine these things all rusty and yellow and stuff, which is always fun to paint. So... Yeah, Cl Clip's brush engine is really, really fascinating. It's better than any brush engine that I've, um, I've been, I've played with, but there's a lot of companies that are getting really close as well. So it's not, it's not like w what they were, what they're doing is like not going to get caught up with other groups. Photoshop's brushes, brush engine used to be absolute garbage, and it's much better now. So you can do a lot. Somebody complained. Um, but I've mentioned in the past, you, you can adjust the pressure sensitivity on a curves basis, which is absolutely huge. Um, because then everyone using the same brush, but if you're heavy handed like me versus someone who's very, has a very light touch or something like that, you can still get the same marks out of everything, uh, just by adjusting the curves. You can actually set up multiple brushes that are based on the same brushes but just have different kind of like, uh, like tolerances based or uh, different different you know pressure sensitivities so that you know if you want a, a more dense brush you can literally do it just by changing some of the curves in the brush settings themselves and they're really at first they just seem a little daunting but they're really not they just they kind of just start to make sense to you So let's start, what do I want to do first, the tread? I'm going to do the claw, get that figured out. Is the grid ruler rules active or was it just for a sketching guide? Is the, um, no, I have it. I just, I set it up after I did those little rough lines. The rough lines I always just kind of throw out to have a general idea of, of, of what I want to have for a perspective in the, in the composition. And then I, I tend to do it that way. I tend to not lay out my perspective before. I roughly figure out what it's going to be and then I just try and match it and you know that's that's kind of a depressing moment when you realize just how bad you are at laying out perspective by eye um, because the grid won't line up to anything that you've done but whatever 
but it's uh it's not, you can turn it on and off so right like right now I don't know how well you guys can see it on your screens but it, it, it right now because I have this snap to special button turned off none of the rulers are actually working um, but once I turn that back on then whatever ruler is highlighted um, becomes active and then I can cycle between all the rulers on the screen and then that allows me to just be really um, flexible with having multiple things going on multiple rulers and not deleting things and if I have something where like I know I'm going to be coming back and adding more detail to a certain area I want to keep that ruler in its general area and not mess it up so of course I'm complicating this this claw to the point where drawing it again on the other character is going to be a total pain At some point, I, I do tend to kind of give up on the rulers as I as sort of I'm sort of used to seeing the shapes, and I don't mind my ellipses being a little bit janky as long as I kind of understand what they're generally supposed to feel like. The um, the rulers cycle. So if you hit Control Four, I'm just gonna do it, and if you guys can see it, that's great. So I've got um, I've got this ellipse tool ellipse here. I've got the ellipse that's on his eye, and you can see those two are green right now, and the grid ruler that I have selected right now is purple. And as I hit Control Four, now this one's purple, and the other ones are basically turned off and I cycle through them and I can just do that as many times as you want and it, it just kind of goes through the through the um, the order of them so now that one's turned on now this one's turned on um, and that it, they, they basically have done that so that you don't like I said you don't have to just you don't have to misplay something like I know I'm gonna come back and do some more work on this hinge right here and I didn't want to move that and then I just turn this button off the top here, this snap to special ruler, which those are the special rulers, and they um, now nothing is is being guided by the rulers. Everything is freehand. Does that make sense? It takes some getting used to. It's a little fumbling around at first, but it's makes sense once you've done it a few times. I'm just keeping my hands. I keep my hand on my keyboard all the time, just like that's where but I do have like when I know I'm doing a lot of perspective work, my hand is basically on control four waiting waiting for me to do the next thing. to make an interesting claw. I couldn't have just done a claw. Just claw. Just draw a claw. Just draw a claw. Nope. Has to be strange and weird. Flares and pistons. It's always fun, just like those little gentle reminders that you're your own worst enemy.
how to apply for I'm just looking at the random stuff so if I miss something just hit it again um, how to apply perspective to these ellipses mine looks a little off um, the general rule the as far as you you point your your major axis down to the perspective the same um, vanishing point that the rest of your perspective is based on so you know like that is following my same perspective but if I had a tube that was like if, you know this eye which is facing perpendicular to that ellipse is facing down towards the other vanishing point over here uh, over to the right and so that's the that's the crux of it it's not um, and then I just sort of eyeball the um, the sort of the, I'll call it the tip but like you know like how much of a of an ellipse it actually is so whatever starts to look right and you really do have to trust yourself on that stuff you have to start to try it out see if it looks right and you may have to adjust it but just keep trying it until it looks the way you imagine it looks right it is a lot of sciences behind the perspective stuff but it's got time for science we got drawings to make. Hey Octavia, thanks for coming out. All right, so and then in here, do a slightly more interesting joint or hinge. This just goes towards having that that level of functionality that just sort of sells robots whether you actually have made something that actually works is an animal with our story the nice thing about working with animators is a lot of the times you design something that you think is gonna work and then they break it for you or you end up pleading your case and finding a really interesting solution to how a new hip could work or that's always that's always a kind of an amazing moment when you discover like some new kind of iconic locomotion system that could be kind of cool and iconic. you know what this thing's gonna need is hoses that's what I love about construction equipment is all the hydraulic hoses the way that they kinda like follow the forms move up the forms love that stuff I've actually st stopped driving and gotten out and gone into like construction areas especially when I see something that has like um, older equipment, you know, like we have, you can tell, like whoever like got hired to do whatever dig that they were gonna be doing, just was penny pinching and had like really old rusty equipment. Oh, that's the best stuff. Is always like the newer stuff is actually getting pretty sleek, so it doesn't have as much kind of character to it. I seem to always have the ruler circle a bit bigger than the than the ellipse that you want to draw is that because it forces the tool to be no that's just a preference thing it's just um, 
you know, here's the ruler tool, you know, and I'm just drawing inside of it. I, I can just see it better. If it's too small, then the difference between this and this may be not as visible. So I think really what all I'm doing is just like setting it at a size that I can actually see clearly that it's like generally in the right perspective that I imagine it would actually live in. Um, like I said, if it gets too small, like I, I'm just not at a point where I can tell the difference. All right, let's get a hose in there. Because he's small, I'm going to just kind of keep the hoses a little bit larger. Just drape that. Again, I always, I I have recently just started adding tons of cast shadows like this into my my sketches, which I never used to do, and it get, and it gets me into a ton of trouble when I have to render things out, but it really really does help me remember that forms are behind other forms, and so I just don't care. I'd rather be in trouble and have things in the right orientation, have good negative shapes, than to worry too much about how I'm going to paint something. This is a, this, I'm just doing these by hand, but this is a great opportunity for just to copy and paste things and just let them be an element that you can repeat. That stuff looks amazing on technology. I recommend taking advantage of your own awesome one vent and then just duplicating the crud out of it. So you can see like, I'm just moving this ellipse. I'm gonna keep it at the same kind of like uh, width, if you will, but I'm just changing its ma um, its primary axis so that it's a little bit more with the going towards that vanishing point. Perspective is just like an endless, endless pursuit. You just have to be willing to have things be um, constant state of that's not quite right and then trying to kind of like eyeball things until they are right so the ellipses facing front have a major axis coming from the left vanishing point nope they go to the right vanishing point here I'll just drop one in so you guys can see I'll do it on a on a separate layer So if I drop an ellipse down, okay, can you guys see that ellipse? So we'll do, we'll pretend like we're going to do this guy's eye. So, oh, I think I'm going into autosave for a second here, hold on. <clears throat> Okay, so I've got my, my right hand vanishing point and my left hand vanishing point. The eyeball is going to, the major axis is going to go down to, if I'm zooming out, this, this axis is going to go back down to this vanishing point over here. And then I find my center point of where that ellipse is going to exist. I'm going to shrink it so it's like um, Casper called me out on where it's just like a little bit a little bit bigger than what I want but that just gives me a general idea and then now as I create his eyes they're sitting in the general perspective that they should be that is, if you 
you know, like a, a character can like move, you know, like he could definitely be like rotating his head down or like, something like that. So that's like something is like rigid, like exactly on that perspective. As soon as you introduce um, a robot or a character that has, you know, something where they could like, you know, change their shoulder directions or change their head position, then you may just not be using an actual vanishing point. But if you were doing it like a stoplight on a box sitting in a perfect grid, then that was that's just basically how you would do it. And I think I am gonna rotate his head down a little bit, so I'm not gonna I'm not gonna keep going on that. Alright, we're getting somewhere. Let's get the let's get his face done. And by all means, don't don't let me make it. <laughs> do not let me make it sound like perspective is just like obvious because it's not. It's um, it's so frustrating. You just have to. You just have to be willing to be a little bit upset if you want to draw things in perspective because very often you'll you'll walk yourself into a corner and realize that everything that you've drawn doesn't make any sense or something doesn't meet up and. Um, is a term that I started coining, which is called eschering, which is basically you draw a bunch of things that don't work in the real sp in real space. The reason, the reason I'm trying to be clear about not worrying too, like, you know, you definitely have to learn perspective. Um, if you want to draw a lot of mechanical things, it's just going to make your life a lot easier. But the theory behind doing a good character and drawing it well in perspective and all that stuff are two different things. You know, if, if you have a good idea and, and you can't get the perspective right, well, the, the issue is just that you're going to have a harder time selling it, but that does not make it a bad idea and a not good uh, design. And I'm kind of adamant about that. Like people who won't draw something because they're afraid that, you know, they're going to get railed or something like that, but they have like really, really good ideas. It's just such a shame to think that an idea was left undesigned and thought of, unthought through because they were too afraid because they they couldn't draw an ellipse or something like that. That's why I like I really like these tools is sometimes you just don't have the energy to go through and figure this stuff out in perspective accurately. But you have an idea that's worth exploring and that's the more important of the two arguments. But then the other side of the coin is just, can you sell your ideas sans, you know, like really good perspective and all that stuff? Probably, probably a little easier if you, if you can. Oh yeah, Scott Robertson's awesome. Um, Scott Robertson's awesome. Um, what else is... He's he's like an art center guy, right? He's like the that kind of perspective. And then there's Marshall Vandruff. I think he teaches some perspective stuff still. That's a really good. He's good. Good bit of knowledge that guy.
and I would I would um, also argue with perspective like don't take it all on at once you know I, I took perspective classes in college and they were great but they were limited you know like I could I could draw a house in perspective and maybe a chair um, I might be able to figure out how telephone poles <laughs> diverge down a street still using perspective that was a tricky one uh, but then there's just a whole bunch of things that you know like when you see like the art center guys designing cars and stuff like that they're just they understand like how to transpose forms across to their side using exact grids how to cast shadows using um, perspective don't take it all on at once um, it's kind of like learning Excel, you know, <laughs> you don't, it's not, it's not going to be useful to you if you try and learn it all at once. Excel's a really weird example, but anyway. All right, so we got his face in. Let's get some. Yeah, I had Marshall in college. He taught me, um, and then I, I took some courses with him after I graduated college. And he's he's great. He's he's loony, and that's the best part about him. It's just like how, how much that guy has, going on inside his head, and he's just so willing to give it up. I think I I'm trying to remember what class I took with him. I think it was a storyboarding. Class. That was pretty cool. And then I took anatomy courses from, he did a Bridgman course um, at Fullerton, I think. Cal State Fullerton. And it was all amazing knowledge. It's nice to have someone who's passionate about that stuff distill it all down in ways that idiots like me can understand. tractor thing and and please be careful with perspective as far as I'm concerned it can really stiffen up your drawings I even think some of this stuff is pretty stiff but you know you just got to be really careful that you don't end up with something that just looks like a like a blueprint drawing to, and lacks all character I'm going to do kind of like my version of a header system. I don't know if you guys are car people. Watch a lot of car, car videos and car restorations where they fabricate all of that stuff. And as much as I love cars, I love it just because like you start to see how things are broken apart. That's really cool. A lot of useful knowledge on that stuff. It's hard to watch those videos if you're not into the stuff, though, I don't want to say you just start watching car restoration mo videos just because you want to be a character designer but if you like cars you like character design I highly recommend putting the two together all right one of my least favorite things to do on these kinds of smokestacks is the holes so the way I usually approach them is I'll just block in Those are too big. Just get wider and thinner. And then just kind of work out the perspective of them. That usually suffices. As long as you're drawing something that's mangled, like this guy, he's going to be a little bit bent up. Nobody's going to care if your ellipses are crap. 
it's the one not one there's many reasons but it's one good reason why drawing this stuff that's all mangled and beat up is so much fun is it doesn't have to be perfect <laughs> cabling on there to see on machinery it's a pretty involved swarmer it just should all right let's... so I know I'm gonna I'm just gonna lightly lay in where like a kind of caution style logo would be I'm not I would definitely do this a different way if I would paint it in and just weather it out if I was doing it for reals all right let's get some wheels going Sorry, I haven't looked at Adam Hawker. Yeah, he's, I don't know him, but I'm going to look into him. Some of those intense perspective drawings look really nice, but they feel dead. Yeah. Yeah, they do. I don't. I was opposed to learning perspective because of that deadness for a long time, but boy, did it, it affect my drawings to not be able to actually do it. Even even using these tools, um, you know, having a general understanding, like it seems like they're just like they kind of do all the work for you, and they, they do a lot of the work for you. Um, but if you don't understand how perspective works, you're not you're you're really not going to be able to do it anyway, even if the tool is insane, because you don't really know what it's supposed to be doing. So there's some general idea of what perspective is doing is paramount even though you don't have to be a master at it it just helps so much just so you know what you're supposed to lay out otherwise you spend a lot of time just kind of like shooting in the dark and then you don't you don't get anything out of it anyway all right let's get that big i'm just gonna imagine it's offset a little bit i think that's gonna look better Yeah, that looks better. There's a funny thing that happens with with uh, drawing in perspective too, where there are these nice moments where you think you have the tool on. And then you realize that you had it turned off and you did everything freehand. That way you know you're starting to get somewhere with your skill set.
some details on these treads and then I think once we kind of get his little waist going on I think we can move on to his brother we can always come back and kind of like keep kind of like cross-referencing details and adding things back to the other designs that are missing. So, besides some little chunks, guys, kind of starting to feel all right. Okay, so let's start doing. What we got twelve. Yeah, we should be all right. If not, we're not. So let's start working on this guy. Where am I gonna start? Start with his eye. So even though I should draw that perspective down, I'm gonna cheat it up a little bit as if he's sort of like leaning forward a little bit. It's just gonna look a lot better. And I am not gonna get it exact. There's just no, no way, but I'm gonna try and mimic the um, the other eye on the little guy. That way they have something in common. using these ruler tools I think if, if it's not painfully obvious it's definitely like a little trial and error thing going on quite a bit of time so buckle up for that I'm not crazy. I'm just going to do the other eye off of that. But because he's it is in perspective, you do have to kind of shrink it a little bit. And there you go. his body first. OK, 
again I'm just generally laying in a few perspective lines so I kind of know where I'm going with things kind of calling back to as much as I can and then we'll start kind of finding ways to deviate that makes sense His face in a little bit, but I think I'm gonna I'm gonna move on to the overall structure of him, and then we'll have a better idea of what's going on with him. How can I learn to understand and draw perspective? You gotta, you, you just, there's no other way around it. You have to start at the basics with perspective. You have to do the thing where you draw a cube um, in perspective, you know, figure out what two point and one point perspective mean. I would not, as you are getting started, definitely do not st start down the path of three point perspective, which is um, a much more accurate, uh, perspective style when it comes to trying to emulate reality um, but it's just it's just not a necessary first step it's what you see when you're like in a extreme perspectives on like you know buildings spider-man um, cities and things like that but I, I I wholeheartedly believe that you should not start trying to learn the heavy stuff first So the Scott Peterson, uh, Marshall Vandruff, those guys, the teachers that are putting stuff out online is a really great way to start. Those guys are fountains of knowledge. Um, so definitely, you know, be looking at those guys. They know what they're talking about. And just focus on just like one or two little things and just start to get your head around it. If you try and take it all on, uh, you're not going to be able to do it. You just, it's just not, it's just not natural. <laughs> so, take your time. Perspective books, um, what's that? The Loomis, uh, Andrew Loomis has awesome awesome perspective books that still hold up because perspective hasn't changed and those are from like the 50s and like how to illustrate the Andrew Loomis books are pretty cheap on on Amazon right now and I, I highly, highly recommend looking into that guy's stuff he's amazing we have, I have PDFs of his somewhere that I, I dig up and he was a illustrator. If you don't know who he was, and just incredible stuff, just such a good understanding of the knowledge, and breaks it down for students. It's 
So start that. Start there. Scott Peterson or Robertson. Yeah, do both. Everyone has their like their own style, and you're not gonna you're not gonna be able to get it all from just like one person. And I highly recommend having something that you want to draw. Don't just start, you know, like it's definitely, you know, the cubes and things like that. But think about something that you want to draw. Um, because if you are just kind of like winging it and just drawing like whatever, you know, if you decide you're going to draw like a 1968 Dodge Charger because that's what the assignment is and you don't like 1968 Dodge Chargers, well, you're not going to have much fun doing it. So do a spaceship instead or whatever the heck you like. Sorry, I'm doing the thing where I get quiet when I'm doing when I'm doing uh, tech things again. I'm sorry. Just is what I do. But if that's any indicator of like how complicated this stuff is, it's just mind-numbingly complicated. see a lot of visual development guys who really just imply accurate perspective and they have a general idea of how things work and that's all that is required in their work to get their really good ideas down and that's what you want to look for is like your your necess your needs for learning a technique are going to be based on like how well you can convey your ideas and if you're able to convey your idea really, really well with very little perspective knowledge, then you may not need to learn it like Andrew Loomis knew it. So I'm starting to work in like that kind of claw arm we got going on the other guy over here. And just how that would work. But I think I'm gonna take a little bit of liberty on the upper arm and have a little fun with it. You know, I just got a little plate here and it's not quite the same. So there's some variation to that shape. It's not like they just took the same exact arm, stuck it on there. It's 
if I was working on a modular system for a game or something like that, I might not do what I just said. But because this is just for fun, I think it's fun to have some variation in there. But when you're de designing a modular system, it is maybe a bit more important to think about like how the same parts function in different ways. I don't know how often that comes up, but that's that's a thing. Do you get your ability to improvise tech and stuff on a figure by just having done a ton of Yeah, there's there's a lot of there's a lot of repeat the way I like to do arms, the way I, do, I like to do that stuff, but um when I'm improvising the tech, it's for me. It's just like how does something rotate? You know, it's kind of like when you look at um, I don't know if you get, how many how many of you guys are like Lego hounds like I was, but you know you dump out your Legos and there's 18 different ways to make the same joint using um, different pieces and mixing and matching that stuff is kind of it's kind of the fun with all this stuff. So I try not to, I, you know, for my own sanity, I like to mix it up and try different joints out. Um, but the the practical part of that is if I find a joint that works really well, then I'll use it in, you know, in a workplace or on a job or whatever you want to say. But it's really just about trying to find the functionality and you know understanding like the rotation and you know like what's going to emulate like muscles and um you know like i i'm going to add that same hose in back here that i did on the other guy so that carries the tech over but the you know you, what i'm doing is i'm actually like creating a little bit of that tricep shape that you see on a person so it's not just it looks it looks cool but the way I just curve that hose you know that 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 follows like human musculature not exactly but the silhouette you know of of that hose thanks appreciate that So up here, I started to indicate like there's like these little secondary hinges. So I'm going to go ahead and start working those in. And that allows like the that other rotation angle of that shoulder. But then I'm just going to fill the rest in with pretend hoses. So this nice thing about hoses is them being flexible is after you anchor them with like a nice hard joint like that then the hoses can just kind of be wherever and then every once in a while I'll put like a strut so there's sort of like a rhythm to it but you know like think about like C-3PO's belly and how they were able to get a lot of flexibility out of his motion because he had just wires there if you have all pistons you know if you do all hard points like this and think and it's really tough to make work But it looks like there's a lot going on in there, even though it's all baloney. All right, let's uh, let's get his face going, and then we can move on to his legs. I do want to keep track of time because I don't want to. I'd like to get all these guys at least designed tonight.
So I'm using like the the digger motif on this thing right here. But I'm not gonna go literal with it, but I do like the idea of him having a little little shade visor going on. If I had done organics tonight, we'd probably be on <laughs> we'd probably be painting it right now. They just go a lot faster. Again, worst enemy, you know? He's gonna be funny. For some reason, like the two-eyed ones are always like the, you know, like the the ones that have like the. Well, we know why, right? Because they have two eyes. But they're always the ones that have the most relatable personality. Oh yeah, if you guys if you guys have some of these resources, that's awesome, Alex. I appreciate you doing that. If you guys actually have any of these resources to for like your go tos for things like perspective and stuff like that, throw them in the chat. It's not like the people teaching it don't want people to find out about it, so definitely share away. I don't know how much James Gurney talks about it in his videos, but he's kind of a master at that stuff as well. James Gurney is more of a painter, but he knows perspective inside and out. He's amazing. All right, so I'm gonna do my cheat for the hoses on this just because I wanna get them just right.
I was mad when I found out when I started doing this hose thing where I just basically draw the shapes out with a solid color just to kind of like get the silhouettes and now I've started doing it with a lot of stuff that I hadn't done it before it was like some sort of like pride thing where like I had to draw it the parallels of how the hose would flow on both sides and what an idiotic thing to hold myself accountable to do so many of those little things just drive me crazy but I just used to like force myself to suffer versus just getting a good idea down time to save right Oh, that's awesome. Oh, I'm, I'm super psyched that you said that because I'm not really a teacher, but I do like talking shop. So you guys have stuff you want to share. That's awesome because I love learning. If you guys, you know, if you guys are like me, like half the reason we do this stuff is just because like things are cool. It's like, that's cool. I want to do that. That's cool. I want to do that. So, that's what this is. I go quiet on you guys again. I'm sorry. I just start thinking about like how this whole little interface thing is gonna work. I'm back. I got it figured out. So I'm trying to introduce like a, just a little bit of asymmetry into this guy's face. Just like I did with the little guy down there. But then I have like a lot of extra space over here. So I'm going to, um, I'm just going to like work on little components to kind of like fill him up. I do want it to look like there's like a little bit of thought behind like why he's built the way he is, but I don't want it to look like a human face because I don't really dig that look for these guys the grill is the grill in the eyes is enough of a um, 
indicator of that stuff. So as I fill this stuff up, I don't, I don't wanna think of it quite so randomly, but so I'm gonna, I wanna like have like some pipes, but I want them to kind of feed almost like, like you know, like the way that your skull will feed your teeth, you know, like the zygomatic bone. And if you want something more alien, then you just, you just kind of like avoid forms like that, you know, uh, logic like that. But if you wanted to have a little bit of like something where people can relate to it, then you kind of follow forms, just like I was talking about with this like tricep muscle back here. It's like, that's a tricep muscle. People get that. So there's like that relatability. So like when you start messing around with things that are really alien, you have these little touchstones of little, like, it's almost like a little promise to people. Like, you know, it's still, it's still a person. It's not really a person, but you get what I say. It's, it's a, it's a being, something that they can relate to. So I got a little air filter in there. Here we get in my drift. And down here where that panel is, we'll just change their tune and have it a little less busy and more like a little control panel or something. So I'm when I'm designing things like these faces, like I'm very, very, I'm not, there's nothing literal, like I'm not like, I have like some like predetermined plan, but there is like a little bit of like thought logic behind like how I'm putting things in. You know, if I want something to feel grotesque and ugly, then, you know, you really deviate away from like human forms. If you want something to be appealing, eyes and that big mouth and just, you know, like making sure that like the forms all kind of like flow the way a human face flows. These, those little things are a little um, common threads that people can relate to. Thanks for coming from Argentina. It's a long flight. Sorry, I'm a dad. I make dad jokes. So I'll be curious what happens next week in our stream. Um, I'm getting a puppy next week. Pretty excited about that. And um, I'm going to be the only one awake at that time. So it may be that we have a puppy joining us next week. So fair warning if you guys are tuning in. getting a Great Dane. It'll be my fourth Great Dane. They are my favorite. Yeah, 
zombies and robots. Yeah, they'll be. Yeah, if you guys will be paying attention to you know, the stuff that I'm doing on Instagram and stuff like that, you're gonna notice a lot more puppy paws in my drawings and things like that. I guarantee you. Happened the last time I had my puppy. I cannot wait. for a movie Casper oh wait I'm not going to tell you what the name is yet it's still a little bit up in the air my daughter has a has her heart set on a couple of names and I have my heart, my names picked out and we're just waiting to see we always wait to see what the animal actually is like before we go naming it because you don't want to name a dog Spaz if it moves like a turtle although the irony can be kind of funny So because of because of COVID, this is the first time we um, worked with a breeder and got a dog. And you have to work with breeders on dogs the like size of Great Danes because you want to make sure that they're healthy, they don't have problems because they can easily have them. So you that's why I always work with a breeder on them. And um, I haven't met this guy yet. Not that that's going to matter, because it's going to be freaking awesome. But I've never gotten a puppy that I haven't met first yet. It's a new wrinkle. <laughs> I'm going to name him Hog and not Casper. <laughs> that would be funny actually I think uh, Jasper with a J was on the table for a while should be a cool name but we have some reasons why we're not doing that we had to move on to the next list. But naming animals is surprisingly contentious. I think more so with everybody being cooped up together. They have so much, much more, all the kids, every, well my kids are grown now too, so they're just much more in charge of themselves so they want to <laughs> they want to be the ones that name the dog and things like that and they probably end up being that way but <clears throat> boy everybody everybody has a say there are a couple names that just thank goodness they ran them you know you run it you had the ability to run them past other people first because there was some that would just sound so terrible coming out of your mouth the test, like my kids named my, um, we had a, a blue Great Dane, same color as a Visa, not a, same color as a Visa, same color as a Weimaraner. Actually, this one's going to be blue as well. And um, my kids were pretty young at the time, and they, they, we promised them that they would get to name the dog, and I didn't think it was going to go as wrong as it did, but they named it Zombie. They named my dog, my beautiful dog zombie so when I it, it sounds funny but when you go on a walk and people are oh you know everybody's oohing and on over this giant that you're walking around and they ask you what his name is and you say zombie you sound like an idiot we're not doing that again but the, the litmus test for picking a good dog name is yelling it into your backyard and seeing if you sound like an idiot and in that case, I absolutely did sound like an idiot. P. 
pit bull named Meatball is amazing. That's perfect. That is such a good name. Their heads look like meatballs. Does she have like that big round head that pits have? Frenchie's six year old named Blue. Blue. And then one and a half named Remy. That must be a lot of energy running around right now. All right, successfully able to draw that claw again. I only have <laughs> three more of those claws to draw. Cool. Let's take a break from claws and go back up and do a smokestack. Yeah, what do they call it? They, we call it. We used to call it the uh, zoomies, right? Is that what? Is that what the dog people say? Always made me feel terrible saying that stuff. Zoomies, but Great Danes are like that too. They'll have a moment where they just lose their mind. They look like they're literally being possessed. I mean, these guys are. Let's see. The last one we had was 220 pounds. This one's probably going to be closer to like 175 based on his parents and when they decide that they're gonna run <laughs> it's just it's kind of comical and when it's in inside because it's a rainy day usually when you when they have that look on their face like they're just about to explode you can get them outside and hopefully they can take out their their mood outside but <laughs> when it's rainy you got a 175 pound dog running around your house definitely an interesting moment that's why they make them cute all right so we got the header thing going on in this guy again so we're tying those two together Get that flap thing going. If we if we paint these things up, I'll do some smoke coming out of these guys just to kind of bring them alive a little bit. chips in that and this guy needs the logo on his back and I'm gonna do I was gonna do like those like prong things those um, that you see on shovels but I think I'm gonna do like Mack truck up here. That'll look cool. Get those like all illuminated when we paint it.
<laughs> Labrador from Build a Bear. That's uh, they don't eat that much, do they? Oh, Irish Wolfhounds are incredible. I've never actually. Oh wait, have I? I don't. I think I saw one on a walk one day, and I was holding a Great Dane, and and the two of us just looked like, yeah, we shouldn't. <laughs> Shouldn't see what happens, which was smart. Um, but I don't, I've never actually been able to play with one. All right, so let's get some hips going on. <laughs> I think this is the longest I've gone without a dog. We lost our dog. Quite a, I don't know exactly exactly now how long. A little over a year ago, and I I can't I usually can't live without him. And then we were gonna travel a bunch because I left Insomniac, and then COVID hit, and we we're just sitting in our house and. Our house has never felt right without a dog. We, I was convinced that it just didn't make any sense to have a, have a dog if we wanted to travel. And then had all these trips planned, and then you know what happened. And then we just looked at each other like, well, <laughs> time to get a dog again. have another dog right now so he's been good but he's kind of older and he wasn't mine to begin with he was my mother-in-law's we inherited him after she passed he's a sweet dog he's a black lab he has a few bad habits I'm just kind of working my way around. I'm definitely drawing off of car tech right here where it's just kind of feels like that center section of a of a car. And then just carry up the sort of negative shapes of the tech back here so it doesn't feel like he's just floating over his hips. So how's the starfish characters going? Who was doing that? Who was doing the starfish characters? The fragile. I don't have time to scroll back up. Of a cool construction y looking hip. It's a little stiff for me, but I'm gonna roll with it. Normally, I, especially in the hips, I like to have a lot of kind of relaxed nature to things. I think it adds a lot of kind of like personality and getting some posture in there. So if you want something to feel heroic, you know, you need to definitely lean into that. All right, let's get some legs on him and then we'll do the other arm. 
So one thing, one habit that I have is like I always do um, <laughs> for the legs if they're posed like this. I pick the leg that's like mostly to the side, you know. So like the leg that's kind of behind this arm is not only occluded by the arm quite a bit, um, but it's also facing me. And so drawing things from the side or three quarters is a lot easier. And then it makes it easier to translate that into more of a front view. So that's how I'm going to start. So I'm going to just kind of generally lay out this leg because there isn't a lot of information from what I sketched. But I know generally what I want. There's an auto save coming. And I think I want to do just like a almost like a straight up piston for this bottom part. Just really lean into that. Vibe. as if it extends up. Cool. Kind of like that. That would be like a nice negative shape as it's walking around. Thanks, Steven. All right, so let's see if we can't figure out what the foot on this thing looks like. <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna reverse engineer this thing. I'm gonna start with the toes. Just kind of playing with this like sort of semi round shape. But I do want them to feel heavy. But I like like on the front of the chin there. <laughs> the chin. The I like that little like round over with that little cut in the middle of it, so I want to play up that. And the side feet. They're like mini versions of that. Start pretending like there's got to be a little like rotation points for like the toes and usually at least two joints, right? So that it's not just like a single flap. So we'll put like a little dog bone in there. I'm just gonna talk it out loud just because people always ask like how to come up with tech. I'm just kind of thinking things from kind of like a how they need to move thing. And then thinking about the sort of like shapes that I have in my mind that I can call to. So I'll do a little flexible part down there. And then we'll get like some crazy ankle going on.
Yeah, I'm, I'm into this angle. This ankle. Let's get like a nice big ankle to kind of like oppose the skinny leg that I always draw. Actually, we can, let's do this. Let's do like a nice thick, heavy joint, kind of like we did on the top of the swarmer little guy. That way we can kind of like echo that shape logic. So that just feels like the same designer, you know, same engineer came up with like what, how these things move and like that. I'll put a little heel down. And I think that is what our foot's going to look like. Okay. I'm gonna just drop this rough down a little bit. As we're starting to add some details, it's starting to muddy it up a little bit. All right, so now, oh, too much, because now I can't even see where I want the other leg. There we go. So now it's like, when we were talking about like perspective earlier, that now it's like, using perspective and just kind of making little dashes to kind of carry that shape around and just looking at where they line up and that's it can it can go pretty quick if if you just kind of use your use your perspective guides to kind of carry the shapes over but you're just kind of like rotating things but you still because they're basically the same length, you're still kind of carrying that shape over at the same heights. If that makes any sense. Like I said, full disclaimer, not a teacher. Just trying to pass on some of what I've been doing. So that's starting to work, right? It looks like his other leg. And then his ankle is going to kind of like rough it in now because it's moved a little bit. So I'm just kind of carrying those lines. Just looking at like generally where they will lay, lie, land. I don't know. English is my first language. But you can see why I like doing this, the leg that's more facing to the side. It's so much easier because then as you start to kind of like reverse engineer like how things actually go together from the front, you're winging it from the front for me is a lot harder to then translate to the side. So if I have a little bit of understanding of what's going on on the side, it's... <clears throat> Yeah, the only person that'll ever say speak your thoughts. <laughs> what are you really thinking, Greg? Nobody wants to know. Okay, so 
Yeah, so now I'm, I'm just kind of like reversing, reverse engineering it backwards and you know, like what forms are covering themselves. And a lot of times this will reveal something that doesn't work and you'll have to go back and adjust it on the other side, especially when you're just kind of making it up as you go. And then there is this kind of beauty to um, some of this stuff where as long as you get one thing working really well, especially the side view where you, like, you show how the tech works, sometimes that alleviates the need for the specificity of the other view to be as accurate. Because it's almost like... Uh, it's almost like the... I'm going to throw my pen. Hang on a second. Right. It's almost like the other design, you know, like wherever you designed it elsewhere on the robot or wherever else is telling the viewer like how something works. And so the, the lack of specificity on the other side perhaps doesn't necessarily have to be as detailed. I don't know. I might be just convincing myself of that, but I think it's true. But you can see like the way that this leg went together, um, or this foot went together, I think you'd have a hard time figuring that side view out if you had drawn this first. This is point two where you draw something and you can see that it's wrong every single time you put the line down. But your hand won't let you draw it any other way. All right, let's put a few details on that and draw another arm. The nice thing about the other arm is a lot of it's in shadow. All right, so that arm comes back. Oops, uh, piston. I'm doing the exact same thing I just did, but this time I'm being even more vague because I'm gonna have almost all of this as silhouette. But I do want the I want the silhouette to be as accurate as possible. But it's all in shadow, so block that in. And boom. And doing the same thing where I'm just kind of like moving up the perspective of each part of the other arm in this case, I'm just kind of building it up slowly in the correct perspective using the other one as a guide as to where things go quiet on you guys again just because once I get once I can get past this general layout of the claw then my brain will start working again on external things
Okay, so now. Work up. This is definitely the trickier stuff with this. Like I just forgot that whole joint, which would have totally screwed me. It's so funny when you submit something or submit something. When you yeah, when you submit something or if you post something and that's the first time you realize you forgot something. <laughs> <sighs> Will I participate in the next Lightbox Expo? I'm not sure if it will be online or not. Uh, as far as I know, the plan is that it will always be online to some extent from now on. So yes, I will absolutely do it. But if they have an in-person and it's safe, I'm doing that for sure. And if I'm not, even if I'm not, uh, if I don't get a booth, which I hope I do, um, but you never know. But yeah, when I was talking with Bobby last, they had such a good success that regardless of whether it's going to, if they can do in person or not, they're still going to have a major online presence. And I thought, that was awesome. <clears throat> I'm looking forward to it. I just I'm using it as an excuse to go out to California and see friends and buy a bunch of books that I don't need and just ah, oh, it's awesome. Love it. It's just so much. Last, I got to go to the first one, just walk around and hang out with friends and just so much talent all in one place. I was like almost like worried like if something happened to the building, like the, <laughs> the world would shake from like the absence of like so much of that talent. Just finish him. All right, I think we just finished him. Always need more like cracks and things like that, but for the most part, that's who he is. So now we can. What time we got? One thirty. Let's at least start working on his big brother here. Definitely a lot, got a lot going on over here. <clears throat> All right, so. Start with the eyes. How many hours do I sleep? Uh, I do six hours for my normal sleep, and then I take a um, 20 to 30 minute nap in the afternoon.
And that uh, that works pretty well. That's it like reboots me. Triclops, you know. No. No. I'm not going to be sleeping much. I'll tell you what, I'm going to be completely straightforward with you guys. If, like, the first week of having the puppy is just complete chaos, then they postpone the stream. But did I draw in the wrong layer? Of course I drew in the wrong layer. All right, let's fix that. That means my perspective tools. Hang on, a little maintenance of idiocy here. Okay, back in business. What's the perspective tool you just used to draw the circles? It's, um, this is Clip Studio, and they have uh, an array of uh, concentric ring tools. They have parallel tools, uh, symmetry tools, perspective ruler tools, um, and this is the concentric ring tool that I'm using right now. And I'm alternating between that and a perspective grid. Um, and Sometimes I'll do the street line tool as well. I like that one a lot. But like, that's the perspective tool so I can get, you know, nice grids. But those are, those are native to Clip Studio. On. I'm gonna go quiet on you guys again as I sort this one out. All right, that look right? Yeah, that looks right. I mean, I do, um, just to kind of like get back on the perspective conversation, I, I, I do like freehanding as much as I can with, when it comes to perspective. And that's just like penance. It's just training. And the more you do it, the better you get at it, obviously. So it's just because you never, like, I guess my, my, my innate fear is like, I'll be working in a program that doesn't have the tools that I'm used to using or something like that and I'll need to be able to still draw so like I just don't ever want to build up a reliance on something like that so to be able to do it but I will say and I think Casper um, asked it one other uh, session does it like does using these tools cause me to kind of get um, worse at drawing this stuff and I would say it, it really is the opposite I um, as I see what it's supposed to look like I form like these like mental pictures of what what I need to be able to draw and so like it just like you're learning to draw anything else in you know from observation I'm literally looking at like how ellipses are supposed to work and function and I'm getting better at them.
hoses going because we need uh well i'm gonna get the beginnings of the hoses going i don't really know where they're going yet <laughs> to double check i was drawing on the right layer so i know i at least know they're coming out that far i don't know where they're going yet we'll figure that out what resolution am I working on? Seems to be more details in this space than usual. Uh, I normally work around 4,000 by 4,000. Yep, 4,200 by 4,200. That's, that's my normal canvas. Five thousand would be better, but I don't know. It's close enough for me. One How do you manage your layers? Um, as few as possible. You should join us one of these weeks when I uh, when I when I paint because it just gets kind of out of hand. But I try. I have a very um, specific way I paint, which re does require a lot of layers, but it's for um, production reasons. Uh, but when I draw. Um, I do try and keep, I, I constantly try and reduce down again as often as possible uh, because multiple layers just gets really, really, con you know, confusing and I just, I can't manage it. But um, I'm not really doing a good job of it tonight, but definitely label as much as your layers as possible as well, which is huge for me. Learn that stuff the hard way. But yeah, and performance wise you know if you if you start asking your computer to do some of this stuff you know with billions of layers it just it just bogs it down obviously modern computers don't have as much issue with that anymore but as an artist i just like to you know keep maintain as few layers as possible Starting to have a face. I'm just kind of winging this guy even before like I've figured out the rest of them. I 
All right, we'll draw for we'll draw for another like twenty minutes or so, like, and then we can just pick this guy, this all this back up, this guy, and we'll paint him next week and stuff. get a general idea of how he's going to look. But I, I will say, um, the original topic for this drawing session was to do factions. If you guys have any questions about like what that means and you know like what it what it's like to go through like the review process of those things or the types of things that are um, usually brought up that you guys are thinking about, feel free to ask those questions. Like if you're, or if you just don't even know what I'm talking about. Like designing factions. That's just like sounds like idiocy. I think I'm going to do so. Just kind of kind of block in generally how the shape should work because I do want to still maintain the blockiness and it's starting to get a little bit fancy looking. I think by having like that, sh that no, it's not a shoulder, but the side of his head be a bit flatter. And then maybe we can work in like a rolled edge. That's gonna work. So cool. So then we can put like a bunch of like his arms will be nice and low down here. Let's get me some tools. Okay, here, perspective to a resolution I answered. Is there a difference between working CMYK versus RGB? Uh, 100%. <laughs> um, if you are working in CMYK, uh, that's basically, um, so that's basically preparing yourself for print. And if you are ultimately going to um, your work is ultimately going to be done for print, then working in CMYK is not such a bad idea. That gives you a lot of access to the channels, um, the cyan, magenta, yellow, and black channels. And that's particularly important for lower quality printing, where uh, if you are um, dealing with a printer 
that is going to use uh, super blacks and things like that, you're going to need to maintain your ink densities. So you're going to need to, you know, be looking at um, how much of each plate, and, and each printer will have a different profile as to like how much ink of each plate can the paper and the printer itself can handle. So it is important. Uh, the main reason that CMYK is different is because it can't produce same spectrum of colors that uh, RGB can handle, can produce, I mean. Um, I'm kind of blazing through this, but something we can talk more about. But all that said, if you are working in RGB and you convert to CMYK to go to print, there are certain colors, if you paint very high chroma, that are going to go muted on you and it's going to look weird. And there are other colors that work just fine. So it's going to definitely affect your final outward output but we live in 2021 now where printing has just gotten so good that the conversion from CMYK from RGB is pretty darn good oh man I tapered the shoulder I shouldn't have done that it looks terrible I mean I like it but it doesn't look like the rest of the guys all right let's start over um, so the um, advantage of working in CMYK is your, whatever you paint is going to be what you're going to get from your printer. So that's that's the advantage. But the disadvantage is you don't have access to the full the full color range, which can be frustrating because uh, there are reds and blues that you just can't get to. So hopefully that answers your question a little bit. If not. Hit me with a follow-up. Um, okay, I still find a Die Hard debate hilarious. I think it's a Christmas movie. It's not a Christmas movie. It just took place in Christmas. Uh, just kidding. I don't care. I think it's a great movie. <laughs> I think it became a Christmas movie. I don't think it was supposed to be one. That'd be like saying like every... Every movie that comes out at Christmas time is a Christmas movie. I've noticed that this last year you put wires covered in fabric or rubber or bandages on your robots. You used to draw more metal wires and thin wires. Is there a reason for that? Because uh, I'm not making games anymore. <laughs> and I can draw the way I want to draw now. I'm just, I was so used to um, drawing things that could be made in games um, that I there was all these things that I just steered away from because it was just so complicated to get them into games and now, now I don't have those restraints and so I'm much more willing to inevitably whether I like it or not the stuff that I would do for myself um, back in those days what, that you're referencing those things would permeate the designs you know like a, the mental sort of vocabulary that I keep talking about is like there's just different things that I'm used to drawing and I kind of go to draw and if I start incorporating things in that were tough to model or tough to rig um, then you know I was just basically making my life harder so I was really fixated on exploring the things that I was also going to be applying in my day-to-day -day jobs. But now that I'm out on my own, I'm just drawing whatever I want. I'm going to design however I want. But a lot of the a lot of the stuff that I draw, I still keep in mind like how it would be rigged ultimately and you know, I do have considerations for that stuff, but I just I don't um, as I'm trying to kind of like build up more vocabulary, I'm not thinking about it quite as much. Uh, Octavia, what do you mean when you're talking about view process? I meant review. I might have just like blurred that word. Review process, meaning like um, you're, if you're in a an actual studio, there's this constant review process when you're... Um, when you come up with a design, 
and you have to run it up against the designers and you know the create other creators on the team make sure that whatever you're creating fits the overall um, you know view of the whole game you know you can't just design whatever you want so you're constantly reviewing things with other team members and making sure that you're um, you're adding to the whole rather than just kind of like designing whatever you want a lot of people that get into character design think that um, the job is just to design the way that you would want to design and that that would be nice but that's not the case you are uh, putting a face on a lot of other people's visions and depending upon the project that freedom the amount of freedom can change quite dramatically. other shoulder in. Let's see if we can't do a little bit of work on the shoulder and then I think that's going to have to be it for tonight. Let's see if we can keep that. You guys cool with just keep working on this thing? I'll just hopefully wrap this guy's um, design up for next Monday and paint him up and we'll have our first faction. Caspi, do you like my explanation? That was spot on. I will say about CMYK and, and RGB, uh, unless you're doing very high chroma stuff, it, it really isn't as big a deal as a lot of people make it out to be. It really doesn't affect your work that much. But if you're going to be making games, work in RGB, because that's the ultimate. That's where it's ultimately going to be. If you're going to be doing print, then you have other considerations. But if you're going to be working in a medium that's never going to be printed, um, you probably want to work in RGB. So let's make, let's make a few notes on this guy of what we're going to pick up. So 
This is something that I do when I know I'm not going to finish a piece right then and there, but I just, I'm kind of like familiar with it. One second, got to save first. Okay, so, so as we've kind of drawn this thing, it's become clear that I'm going to need to find a home for these hoses. And then I think that there needs to be a bit of a cradle here. But we do want to do the same kind of hip What's going on in the little guy? So we want that to be nice and thick. And then as far as the engine tech goes, I'm going to do slightly larger exhaust pipes. And I think I'll have them stick up and do that type of thing. But I want to do duels. Which would be cool. Because the kids love cool. And then we can do like some cool tech in here. Yep. And then Reverse, same kind of pistons as the other ones, but we're going to do them reverse. But when we get down to the ankles, go big again. And we now know what the outrigger stuff can look like. So we may have to give ourselves a little bit more room, but we can work that out. think be in good shape. Cool. All right. I'm going to take it easy on myself. Yeah, I know. This whole CMYK RGB thing is, it's a, it's a really big topic. And um, it's one of those things where it can, it can cause you a lot of concern unless you um, if you don't know what you're actually going to use it for so understanding it is great but actually understanding application for it is better and that's why I was just trying to be simplistic about it because you can get bogged down in them um, if you but if you are ultimately going to be going to print it's just such a different conversation than if you are never intending to really go to print with your work because CMYK is obviously just print um, but to Casper's point about how it's very brief about it, it does matter when you want to move to traditional work because paint is essentially just um, a different kind of mixing in CMYK and the thought process behind that really does factor into that stuff. So big conversation, but we can get into it more. Um, but before I take off for this week, do you guys... Uh, have any questions that came up with stuff that I was doing? Any more perspective stuff? Um, next week, I'm going to finish drawing this thing, obviously. And we're going to paint them up. And just kind of create like a finished piece. And I definitely want to do more of this. I want to do some organics. Um, I wanted to go through one kind of like set just kind of like you could kind of see like the shape language and how it carries throughout the entire um, character set but then the next sort of like step and sort of like understanding like how to do this stuff is like 
thinking about the world like we you know i think there was a question early on about that uh, thinking about the world thinking about um, the color palette and how it relates to the world thinking about the environment think about the purpose of the characters thinking about the modularity the personalities there's so many things that we can talk about so cool thank you very much i don't take compliments very well but i appreciate it but i hope you guys are getting a little something out of this at the very least something to laugh at on monday nights Um, yeah, well, if there's nothing else, I will catch up with you guys on Monday. Like I said, we'll paint the sky up and then we'll take a break from the faction things for like one week, do something else, maybe a free draw or another painting or something like that. And, uh, then we'll do another faction. I kind of want to do more of this. Um, and if you guys are, I know we kind of skipped over the whole, like doing a weapon thing. Maybe that's what we'll do in between these things. We'll do a weapon. <laughs> You guys, you know, I hope, I hope it goes well because I want to just like be in here, and you guys will like go from me just like sitting in the chair constantly to me like taking breaks and playing with puppies and stuff like that. Well, no, who knows? Well, I don't have no idea how it's gonna go, but I'm excited. All right, I will catch up with you guys on Monday then. Thank you very much for guys for hanging out with me. It was awesome as always. I really appreciate you guys doing, uh, asking questions and just hanging out with me super cool and uh like i always ask if if you guys haven't already just hit the likes on the on the youtube if i didn't piss you guys off and that just helps me out a ton um all right oh casper did you use the grid rules to other than to line up the ellipse rulers uh yeah i did a little bit um like when i'm when i'm first starting things uh, I will, I'm just going to throw it on a different layer. If I have the perspective on, I will I'll make sure it's on. Okay. So like if I'm going to, if I'm starting like the, the body on this, like I'll just make these little dashes like this to kind of generally get my hand going in the right direction. So like for this guy, I made the vertical, this middle guy, I did the verticals and I did like a couple of quick horizontals, like at the base of his chin. And those just kind of like helped me get the ball rolling. Um, so yeah, I don't use it very much. I just use it like, you know, and another thing I do, like if I'm, if I've got this shoulder, I'll definitely carry that line over and then I'll just delete it. But then I know right about there is where I need to put the line. So it just like I use it just to kind of like draw out lasers and that way like I know like the, the shoulder is going to be somewhere around there. So um, I don't use it as much for the actual drawing as much as I do to kind of like get me in the right places. And I think that kind of helps take out some of the stiffness. Cool. Well, if you have to pick one, I'll keep the middle one. Thank you. <laughs> Well, we'll see how this big guy comes out. Maybe he's awesome. Maybe we'll give him a gun or something like that. You never know. All right, we'll see you guys next week. Hit save. <laughs>